Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends to this second and concluding lecture on this new topic that we have started that is political theory and environmental uh, ethics and what kind of uh, challenge that environmental uh, crisis or climate change pose to political theory as a discipline. So, this is some of the thing which we have been discussing and in the last class we have discussed how uh, this climate change or environmental crisis emerge. Uh, historically, uh, especially after the post industrial development of um, discourse about going back to uh, land or romantic environmentalism and more specifically from the 1960s and 70s when there is a kind of uh, gloom and doom about environment and then we have seen the responses to uh, the climate change or environmental crisis especially through uh, the three kind of responses that is deliberative democracy, the idea to extend or expand the notion of citizenship to include environmental citizenship and finally inculcating some of the green virtues. So, this we have discussed in the previous lecture. Today we are going to very briefly discuss this whole issue of climate change and different negotiation that have uh, emerged to tackle or confront this uh, uh, climate change or environmental crisis and will focus more on this concept of environmental justice and how it tries to extend the understanding of justice that we have done as a topic separately in this course. So, how environmental justice expand uh, those notions of uh, justice we will focus more on that. While doing that, we will also try to see how environmental justice or uh, environmental crisis and many of the requirements that it necessitates uh, is consistent or inconsistent with many of the values and premises of liberal democracies and liberalism. So, climate change and environmental crisis pose a serious challenge to humanity as a whole. Uh, this point we have covered in the previous lecture. So, it is not just to political theory that it poses a challenge, it also poses a challenge to many of the problems that humanity as a whole faces. There are certain direct impact of climate change, but there are many indirect effect or influence of uh, climate change and world as a whole. Whether uh, that part of the world is the cause of the problem or not, they all face the effect of climate change. This point we have discussed. So, it poses a challenge to the humanity as a whole and tackling it requires a new set of values which will lead to newer domestic and world political order. So, what climate change or environmental crisis require is to develop a new set of value which will lead to create a new set of domestic or international political order and many of the values and approaches to politics in its present form are simply not adequate to solve this uh, problem of climate change or environmental crisis and therefore, environmental issues demands new lexicon, new concept or new terminology of politics and democracy in modern society. So, it necessitates new values, new concepts, new terminology to understand the problem and then respond positively to tackle this problem successfully. So, in the previous lecture we have discussed how it argues for change in the notion of democracy and emphasize on deliberative democracy with free speech, environmental citizenship and inculcating green values among the individual and communities to tackle the problems of climate change. We have also discussed how it required efforts at local, national and international levels 
and it also requires modification in the pattern of consumption and in that individual, community, state, market and international agencies all play a significant role. So, there has to be a network, a kind of coherent or a kind of continuous effort starting from the individual to the local to the national to the international uh, level. In tackling the climate change, uh, all these players play a very significant role. So, it cannot be tackled by one country because the climate change as a problem is beyond the purview of a single nation or single country. It cannot tackled only by few countries or a group of countries because another countries through its emissions or present rate of consumption and emission of greenhouse gases can jeopardize the efforts of climate change by other countries. So, it requires a kind of collective effort to uh, tackle it that starts from individual to community at the local level to the national and international level. Now, in this lecture today, we will focus briefly on climate change and environmentalism and how it is consistent and inconsistent with some of the liberal values and premises. However, we will focus more on the notion of environmental justice. Climate change in today's world is a reality and many parts of the world are affected by it. It raises questions to the fundamental concepts of political theory that we have discussed such as justice, what is fair share, who has obligation and how much, who share the responsibility and uh, should all share the same or equal responsibility, those who are polluter or those who are the victim of pollution. So, there should be differentiated role or there should be a uniform equal role for everyone. So, these are some of the concepts that requires fresh uh, theorization or revision in the light of new development, particularly the climate change and environmental crisis. So, a Stockholm conference in 1972 begins a serious discussion on the relationship between man and nature or man and environment. It was in this conference for the first time that environmental justice as a term was invoked by developing countries against the developed countries. I will come back to this point again in later part of this lecture, but the uh, contemporary times a Stockholm conference was the beginning of a serious uh, deliberation on this notion of environmental justice. And since then there have been numerous discussion and debates on environmental issues at the international level. Uh, Rio summit or earth summit in 1992 was one such major international summit of head of the state. So, many head of states in 1992 participated in this uh, summit which is called earth summit and that is a testimony of the seriousness of the environmental issue that is posing the serious challenge and threatening the very existence of humanity or uh, many non-human species on the planet. So, it was here at the um, Rio summit that United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that is UNFCC was officially opened for signature and it came into force in 1994 and now there are 194 countries who have ratified this. Now, this convention on climate change or framework convention on climate change which is under the aegis of United Nations all the international negotiations on climate change largely operate within this framework of United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So, further on in 1995, uh, we have Kyoto Protocol that was signed with the objective that developed countries will reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases to pre-1990 level in a time bound manner. But unfortunately, not much in this direction was actually uh, realized and most of the uh, targets of Kyoto Protocol are not made. So, now the most uh, recent achievement in this direction is the Paris Agreement, which is uh, seen as a remarkable achievement as there is a kind of universal consensus on having a binding commitment towards uh, reducing greenhouse gases or to tackling uh, climate change or environmental crisis. However, the future of Paris agreement is also uh, doubtful, especially when the US which is one of the largest 
uh, emitters of greenhouse gases has pulled back or withdrawn from the Paris Peace Agreement. So, in these uh, international negotiations or deliberation on climate change, we have seen that there is a uh, response, there is a seriousness that is attached to the issue, but when it comes to acting upon it or implementing those uh, decisions or the agreements that is arrived at, uh, the world as a whole is not effectively implementing those uh, agreements which is arrived at the international uh, deliberations and conference on climate change. So, what is the biggest challenge in the climate change discourse and measures that is needed to tackling uh, the climate change? The biggest challenge in that is the uh, sharp divide that exists between the rich and the poor, developing and developed countries and therefore, the question of who shares the responsibility, who bears the cost and who uh, benefits out of this tra treaty and that becomes a central contentious issue in environmental debates and deliberation at the global level. So, human and non-human present generation or the future generation. So, in the climate uh, change, it is the future generation who has no role in causing environmental change or uh, climate change and yet they will be the worst victim of climate change. So, uh, these issues makes any effective uh, implementation of agreements or deliberation very problematic because of this division between rich and poor, developing and developed world, human or non-human, present generation and future generation that makes the whole uh, discourse of climate change or environmental debates a very contentious and technical issue and there is no consensus, there is no agreement on how to go about it, who is going to share the cost who will be the beneficiary of uh, these agreements and uh, deliberation. So, the scale of challenge is such that it requires the participation of all, be it individual, community, state, market or the global agencies. So, all should come uh, forward to uh, tackle this challenge, which requires the change in the uh, values, lifestyles, the way we consume and so on. So, uh, it requires a kind of concentrated or the collective effort uh, uh, to tackle because of the sheer scale of the problem of climate change. It also requires and put emphasis on new set of values and order of politics as I said it requires new lexicon of politics both at domestic or at the international level and the politics as usual and wait and watch methods of tackling any problem such as climate change will not work in any effective manner to tackle uh, a problem like climate change. So, the now uh, question before us is will international regimes such as UNFCC or say Kyoto Protocol or Paris Agreement or Empowered Group of 21 and so on, will they work in an effective manner to climate change or global warming or it is still the state within its territory, which is more effective in uh, implementing environmental laws. So, such as uh, Germany or Netherlands or New Zealand and many such countries who are more effective in comparison to say international agencies or regimes who are responsible for tackling climate change or arriving at a consensus about um, uh, responding to the uh, climate change. So, the question before us is that is it the international agency who should play a more decisive role or more influential role in tackling climate change? Have we uh, achieved uh, much out of the international conference regimes or summits or it is still the nation state within its own domestic territory that is more effective in uh, terms of uh, curving climate change and global warming. This is a still an open question because uh, while the states within its territory is trying to be more responsible to the environmental challenges, but then there are many states which is also giving priority to the economic development as it is understood today by neglecting some of the environmental concerns. So, then the international agreements or regimes play a significant role. 
However, on the other hand, the international uh, agreements or uh, deliberations is also not as effective as it should be or as it is expected. So, many scholars have now consensus that the um, approach of wait and watch and business as usual will not help in mitigating uh, the climate change and we may reach a stage when it will be too late to do anything about climate change. This remains an open question uh, not just for political theory, but humanity as a whole to how to go about it. Now, if we look at some of the consistencies and inconsistencies between environmentalism and liberal value, we will see how environmentalism pose a kind of serious uh, challenge to some of the values and foundational premises of liberalism. So, it questions many core premises and values of liberalism and it argues for various uh, changes in such values or premises. So, first in liberalism, uh, the argument is that a state should be a neutral body, it should not uh, take side, it should not take normative position. So, as an institution, it should be a, a neutral institution without taking any normative side from any sections of the society. So, it should be a neutral entity or institution. And then the very premise of liberalism is there is a kind of divide between self regarding or the others regarding functions and a state has a role only in others regarding function. Now, these premises of liberalism is challenged because it fails to recognize the role of individual, community and state in tackling climate change. In other words, it argues for a value committed and non-neutral policies of the state to set new values for the individual and communities to tackle the challenge and standards in the society. So, in contrast to the liberal idea of state neutrality or division of life between self regarding and others regarding, uh, the environmental activist or the scholars argue to make a state value committed and that value is towards the environment, protection of environment, safeguarding the environment, protecting the ecology protecting the natural habitats and so on. So, uh, the state to tackle environmental uh, challenges and the crisis needs to be a value oriented state. It has to have a non-neutral policy that will lead or help in creating new set of values and standards in the society for the individual and communities to follow. So, a state cannot act like a neutral agent without any concern to environment or other issues in the society. So, in contrast to the liberal ideal of state neutrality, environmentalism argue for a value committed non-neutral policies of the state. So, the premise of this argument is that everything is connected to everything else. So, uh, in the liberal idea is that there is the uh, sphere of life where the individual action is just uh, limited to his own self and it has no influence on the others. Whereas, environmentalism uh, discourse believe in this idea of everything is connected to everything else. So, no action is innocent or in isolation. It cannot be seen or it cannot be understood in uh, isolation, but it is always connected to something else. So, any actions of individual or community, whether it is self regarding or the other regarding is always part of some problem or part of solution. So, there can be many examples of it. So, as an individual, you may prefer to go for a walk in the wild or in the jungle, but also there may be some individual who want to have nice road to drive a car and so on. Now, this two kind of uh, value preference going for a walk in the jungle and having a nice road uh, to drive a vehicle is not uh, consistent with each other. Now, how to uh, develop a balance where the individual having the preference for going to a jungle for a walk and the person who uh, want to drive a nice car on the road should uh, be consistent with each other and that is the uh, real uh, problem. So, uh, for environment, your preference, your values or actions may either be uh, the part of solution or be the part of problem. It cannot be something which is in, in isolation and just limited to one individual and his life alone. So, uh, the environmental uh, premise of arguing against state neutrality is this idea that every action 
or everything on this planet is connecting to everything else, your habitat, your lifestyle, your consumption influence something else. So, the uh, clothes you wear, the food you eat, um, the modes of transportation that you use is not just limited to your own uh, individuality, but it also has influence on the environment, maybe in the negative or in the positive sense, but all your actions has some connection to the larger issue. So, the point here is that environmentalism argues against the neutrality or the idea of state neutrality or division of self regarding and others regarding action in liberalism and those ideals are inconsistent with the environmental ideas of uh, arguing for a value committed and non-neutral policies of the state to set new values and standards in the society. So, the challenge for democracy and politics in contemporary times is to strike a balance between different choices and preference of individuals and communities in a manner that help in meeting getting climate change and that requires constant negotiation and renegotiation of many of uh, the values through which or by which individual and communities live or organize their life. So, the problem with environmentalism and liberal value is that many liberal values such as the idea that individuals should be a lord. So, in the liberalism if you remember individual is understood as a self defining rational agent who knows what is in his or her best interest and a state should permit the individual freedom or liberty to express himself or to do what is good for him and a society which provides the maximum a scope uh, for the individual creativity and uh, freedom to do what he wish to do and what he or she thinks is good for him or her, then that society will be a more prosperous society. So, that kind of liberal understanding of allowing or giving individual scope or liberty to do or act as they please are not inconsistent with the commitment to the environmental value, because environmental issue or the crisis requires individual to act, behave, consume and live in a particular manner. And therefore, this liberal idea of allowing individual to do or act as they please is not inconsistent with the commitment to the environmental value, which requires changes in the attitude and lifestyles of individual and community. So, climate change and environmental crisis is going to affect both those who care for environment or those who do not. So, uh, the crisis of environment or the climate change or global warming is not something which is uh, affecting only those who do not believe in it, but also those who believe in the climate change are equally affected or victim of uh, the climate change. Now, the point is for modern liberal democracy and politics is to how to struck a balance where the preservation of environment goes along with allowing the people to lead their lives in their preferred ways. Do we have such option or can we still deny the climate change? How far the messy world of politics in its present form are capable of striking such balance? So, these are some of the contentious issue of our modern politics and democracy where we continue to believe in the individual in a responsible rational manner and yet their lifestyle consumption affects the environment in a very uh, destructive manner. Now, should we permit that or how to maintain a balance where we will preserve or protect the environment, but we will also allow the individual to live the life the way he or she want to live. Now, in the present the politics to arrive at a balance, uh, balance between these two is something which is uh, very difficult to arrive at and this remains one of the problem with environmentalism or many of the value preferences and premises of uh, liberalism. Now, we will finally, move to the idea of environmental uh, justice. The central or foundational idea of modern liberal democracy is a commitment to the principle of justice. So, the idea of justice is very much central to the liberal idea or liberal democratic ideal there is a commitment to the notion of uh, justice. However, this idea is also central and very much central to environmentalism. It is often argued that although environmentalists 
have taken the idea of justice seriously, it is the liberal political theorists who for a long time have not taken the environmental seriously and this we have discussed in the liberal uh, uh, traditions especially in the social contract tradition of Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau, how nature is central, but nature in this uh, tradition is seen as a entity which do not have any value of its own. So, something which has no value or without value unless the human uh, mix his labor with the natural resources. Only when the human mix his labor with the nature, then the nature acquire its value. Otherwise, nature in itself has no value or is without value. So, the argument is in the environmentalism whether justice is taken seriously, but many liberal political theorists have not taken the question or the issue of environment that seriously. So, Aristotle for example, talks about two kinds of justice that is distributive and corrective justice. Now, uh, this notion of justice we have discussed particularly the distributive concept which talks about the ways in which goods, resources or burdens in a society is distributed among its member. However, the corrective justice in contrast is about the compensation or the punishment for some wrongdoing, some uh, historical injustices, what should be the compensation or punishment that should be met, that is the part of corrective justice. But justice is uh, seen as a distributive concept which deals with how uh, goods and resources and burdens in a society is judiciously or equally divided or distributed among its member. Environmental justice include both although it focus more on the distributive aspect of justice. So, if some has caused harm to others natural habitat or natural resources, then corrective theory of justice applies. However, the environmental justice is primarily a distributive justice. So, here uh, in this understanding, environment is seen as a resource like any uh, economic uh, goods, money, food or so on in the society and how it should be distributed here with the environment is uh, something very special that its distribution is not just limited to the present generation. So, the question for judicious distribution of uh, natural resources is not just limited only to the human or, or just to the present uh, generation, but it also includes how environment and uh, clean environment is made available also to the future generation. So, uh, how it should be distributed not just among the present, but also among the future generation necessitates the principle of distributive justice. However, unlike other resources, environment cannot physically be transformed from one community to the other community. And therefore, the distribution of the benefits and costs of environments requires principle of justice. Now, um, how exactly this cost and benefits are decided? What principles of justice are deployed for its distribution? And who are the subject and beneficiaries of such distribution are open questions. So, it is about distribution, but on what principles it should be de uh, decided? So, as I said that uh, there are countries who played major role in polluting the environment. Now, when it comes to uh, bearing the cost of such pollution, should the victim of climate change or the polluter bear the same cost or equal cost or there should be differentiated role or differentiated principle. So, these are some of the things which remains open for discussion and deliberation and there is no universal consensus on these questions and these are still being discussed and debated in climate negotiations locally, nationally and globally as well. So, since 1970s the idea that environmental justice is uh, global in scope has been discussed as I said in the Stockholm conference in 1972. So, for the first time at the United Nations conference on human environment in Stockholm, the idea of environmental justice was introduced by developing countries against the developed countries demand or claim over clean environment and ecology which was available mostly in the developing countries. Now, after the publication of global warming in an unequal world 
a case for environmental colonialism in 1991 by the Indian environmentalist Anil Agrawal and Sunita Narayan, the idea of environmental justice was more seriously discussed and debated. So, the argument for environmental justice is largely coming from developing and least developed countries, which argue that rich countries are responsible for many of the environmental challenge. As in the course of their uh, development, they emit a disproportionate amount of toxic gas and waste and they continue to extract more than their fair share of earth resources. So, the idea of environmental justice is largely invoked by the least developed or poor countries against the rich or prosperous country because of their role in polluting the environment and also in the present day their extraction of earth resources more than their fair share in the planet's resources. So, one of the example that is often given uh, to understand this proportionate cost and benefit of uh, such discourse is the consumption of uh, or emission of uh, greenhouse gases by different countries. So, for example, on a per capita basis Americans emit 5 times as much carbon dioxide which is one of the greenhouse gases causing climate change and global warming. So, on per capita basis Americans emit 5 times as much carbon dioxide as a Chinese and 10 times as much as an Indian. So, the share of burden should just be equal or it is in proportion to their role in polluting the environment or causing the climate change. So, although China and India's share of greenhouse gas emissions has uh, been increasing, but in comparison to the uh, global north or the prosperous countries, they are still in the phase of economic development or social transformation and um, to be responsible to the climate change or environmental protection, it requires some serious rethinking about development and so on. So, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change set the goal as stabilizing greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And the UNFCC operates on this principle of common, so all the nations of the world has a responsibility towards climate but that responsibility is not equal. It has to be common but differentiated responsibility and that is the overall framework in, in which uh, the climate negotiation and climate change deliberation operates. So, there are many negotiation still um, going on to achieve uh, this target and the latest among them is the Paris Agreement as we have discussed. So, one of the model in environmental justice is besides this corrective or distributive notion of justice, the model of participative justice and this is argued by Iris Marion Young and in this model emphasis is on the participation of different stakeholders in climate change or negotiation. So, people object not only to the fact that they were subjected to risks, but also to the fact that such exposures to risk are without their consent. So, they were not given participation or enough participation while uh, climate change or climate uh, uh, mitigation discourse are uh, taking place at different uh, levels. So, those who suffer most are not often at the table of negotiation. So, for example, sea level rise can completely destroy countries like Kiribati or Maldives. So, these countries may be virtually non-existent because they will be below the sea level. So, their land mass will be under the water. Many countries in Caribbean or elsewhere will be ravaged by more intense and more frequent storms and hurricanes. Countries like Bangladesh may suffer from uh, catastrophic floods and so on. And still uh, these countries have hardly any effective voice in the climate change negotiation. So, this participative model of uh, justice in environmental discourse requires more and more participation of those who are the victims of climate change or worse um, victim of climate change. 
So, many of these countries denied participation not because of political or institutional failures, but often they are not recognized as equal player in the realms of discourse on environmental justice and this is not new as we have discussed in say uh, equality or justice that how a society excludes certain groups such as women, children, uh, aliens or foreigners from their uh, idea of say citizenship or equal citizenship or free citizenship and so on. So, that requires constant struggle, constant expansion of democracy to include those who were excluded. That is also happening with climate change discourse when there are many victims or the worst victim of climate change not given equal participation in climate change negotiation and participative model of uh, environmental justice talks about making their negotiation more democratic more participative especially of those who are going to be the worst victim of the climate change. So, besides that there are many scholars and environmental activists who argue that there are many entities such as plants, animals, species, ecosystems, geological formations such as mountains, rivers and lakes and so on who cannot speak for themselves. Now, the change in the environment also affect them who cannot speak for themselves. So, in the climate change discourse, they should also be included in the debates and in fact, many countries now began to recognize the rights of non-human entities such as rivers, mountains, planet and so on. So, uh, environmental justice has different models. We have discussed the corrective model of justice or distributive model of justice which is equally applicable in the environmental uh, discourse. Then we have also discussed the participatory model to include especially those who are um, the worst victim of climate change and also those who cannot speak for themselves such as plants, animals and other species and geological formations. Now, to conclude environmental crisis pose serious challenges to political theory and it necessitates new set of values and new models of democracy. Earth's fundamental structure are altered by climate change and loss of biodiversity and many species have become extinct and many more are on the verge of extinction. So, Rachel Carson uh, the silent spring that we have discussed in the first lecture talks about uh, such extinction of uh, many species uh, from the pl planet and its influence on spring or the different seasons. Wildlife is everywhere in retreat. This is a challenge as well as an opportunity for new set of values and models of political system to emerge. Now, as a collective effort or respond to climate change, if we are successful in responding to climate change and tackling it effectively, then it is going to make us more better or a responsible citizen and it will also strengthen and uh, deepen democracies in the society. So, the question then is will it happen especially in the messy world of pragmatic politics where politics are driven by short term or immediate goals rather than long term objectives such as climate change or global warming. Now, will that happen that will be determined by the collective efforts of individual, community, state, market, nation and uh, the international agencies such as UNFCC. So, uh, that uh, their efforts collectively will determine how far we have we are successful in targeting the objectives of achieving the goals that is set for controlling or tackling climate change. So, there are many hopes such as many countries have legislated environmental laws. In fact, many countries recognize the clean environment rights to its citizens. So, including in Indian constitution article 21 which talks about right to life is also interpreted as right to clean environment. So, right to life is not just about living and breathing, but it also includes a right to clean environment. Similarly, many countries uh, recognize such rights of their citizen and also future generations. So, for example, in 1970, Senator Gaylord Nelson in US argued 
that every person's inalienable right to clean environment must be included in the US constitution. Although this proposal was defeated, but subsequently 16 US states and about 130 countries including India and China included protection of environmental laws in their constitution. Now, uh, so these are the positive steps in changing or uh, changing the norms or the existing uh, behavior or lifestyle or uh, consumption of individual society in terms of becoming more and more responsible to uh, the environment or the protection of environment. But there are lot more that is uh, needed. So, um, there are positive steps, but then there are many uh, more things that is needed to tackle uh, this challenge and most importantly we need to change uh, the value uh, uh, which uh, will ultimately lead to uh, a new lexicon of politics, state, democracy, citizenship and so on that will help in expanding the notion of citizenship and also uh, the democracy. So, environmental uh, crisis do pose challenge to political theory and some of the concepts of political theory requires revision or uh, re-theorization in the light of newer challenges of uh, climate change or environmental crisis. And as I was saying that political theory is about engaging with the real or the pragmatic issues that humanity or society as a whole is facing. And the contemporary challenges in 21st century and the biggest among them is the climate change and global warming. So, how political theory help in theorizing certain uh, new terminology, uh, new concepts or value premises to help uh, those environmental changes. Some of these we have covered in these two lecture. So, that is all in today's lecture. For today's lecture, you can refer to some of these books like Godin Robert, Green Political Theory, uh, from Katrina McKinnon, again issue in political theory, that is a very good chapter on uh, environmental justice to understand environmental uh, crisis or climate change and how democratic response to climate change can be the effective measure to tackling climate change. And also John Hoffman and Paul Graham, you can refer to understand uh, some of the themes that we have discussed in environmental uh, ethics and political theory. So, that is all in today's lecture. Thanks for listening. Thank you all.